invite you to turn with me in the gospel according to Luke chapter 9, verses 22 through 27. It's good practice to find your way through scripture. Our ushers are bringing around Bibles if you'd like one, uh, so you can find your way and develop that good habit. Reach out your hand, they'll put a Bible into your hands. Always good to learn our way around and know how to find what God would say to us. It's an easier one today, Luke. Early on in the New Testament there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, Luke chapter 9. We're starting halfway through uh, some things that are going on in verse 22. It's always strange to begin uh, Scripture reading with the word saying, uh, but we're doing that to pick up the things that Jesus is talking about. So it's Jesus said these following things, Luke 9. 22 through 27. Listen to these words. Jesus said, The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Then he said to them all, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when He comes in His glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you bow with me for a moment of prayer? Lord, we hear those words of Jesus. We let the challenge of them ripple over us. Sink them down deeply into our hearts now as as we ponder and share them together. They end with those words, O God, that, that, that call us to an awareness of how You work and who You are. At the end of that passage, when Jesus says to them, some standing here will not taste death until they see the kingdom, and yet we know that all those disciples standing around would go on and taste death, and even Jesus Christ Himself would taste death. So the kingdom, O oh God, must be something more, something different than we often give it credit for being. Not something lying down the corridors of time ahead of us. Not, not something waiting that we wait for but something now, something immediate, something those disciples saw and were part of while they yet lived. Something that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ ushered into this world. And we who gather to be Your church, we are to be citizens of that kingdom. So call us now to follow after Jesus Christ that we would see that kingdom, live in it, and share it with the world around us. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, and the actions that we take because we've been here together today. May all these things, O God, be pleasing and acceptable to You. You are our strength and our Redeemer. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a word in the life of the church that's a fairly key word. It's spoken a lot. You find it all over the place in the Gospels. Jesus uses it a lot. We use it day after day. At least your pastor uses it. It's an important enough word that it's even in the official mission statement of the entire United Methodist Church. So it's got to be one of those words that's important. And it is. The word is disciple. And we hear it and you know it's important. It's got to be important. And yet, it's a word that I don't think what we've really lived into. It's a word that, that means more than we think it means. If I asked you what it means, what would you answer? What does the word disciple mean? If, if I asked you to describe how you become one, or what a disciple looks like, or, or what the world should see from the life of one who claims to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, what does that look like? What are the answers to those questions? And I don't think those answers are easy ones. There's a lot behind that word we use every day and all the time. Luke clues us in to one of the the basic meanings of it. It's a follower. Other Gospel readings render the words of Jesus a little bit differently. They have Jesus say, any who would be My disciple must deny themselves 
and take up their cross and follow Me. Any who would be My follower must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Me. And there we have it, there in Luke. Pretty easy answer to those questions. What's a disciple? How do you become one? What does that look like? So it's not that we can't find the answers. It's not that the answers aren't pretty clear in the Gospels. But, but no wonder when we look at what that word disciple means and we go there into Scripture and we see what Jesus says that we would tend to back away from it. Because that's not as easy as it seems, is it? Those who would be My disciple must deny themselves and, and take up their cross and follow Me. Can't we substitute one of those other words? I mean, we like believer. A believer's a good word, right? And that one's easier than disciple. Jesus doesn't say those who are believers have to do all these things. No, belief is easier. So let's go with believer. The church likes that one. We like that one. The only funny thing is Jesus didn't seem to like that word all that much. He tended to use disciple. They must not mean exactly the same thing. We're beginning today to look more closely together at what it means to be a disciple. We're going to do that for a few weeks in sermons, and then later on in the fall, we'll invite you to enter more fully into that Word, to explore what it means for you, to offer some ways to answer those questions. What is a disciple? And how do we become one? And to give us opportunities to enter into that, to live into that, because it is something that we come up to and then tend to back away from. So today, let's look at that, that basic definition, that, that basic road that Jesus lays out as challenging as it is. Those who would be My disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow Me. How are you doing with the first step? How's your self-denial doing? And how dare I even bring that up in August? I mean, we're the church. We know how to deal with self-denial. We lock it into a little season of the year. It's called Lent. For six weeks leading up to Easter, we, we explore the agony and the misery of denying ourselves. We give up chocolate. I mean, it's miserable. We feel awful about things. The cross gets so much more real because of the absence of sweets. I know they warned me about using sarcasm in sermons, but sometimes you just can't help yourself. And even giving up chocolate is so awful that we can only give ourselves six weeks to do it in because who could handle it for the rest of time? And today, we are safely six months away from Lent. Either way you go. And yet here I am bringing up self-denial. Not keeping it in its proper season, but bringing it for you today. How's that self-denial going? So much easier to lock it away in a season and ignore it for the rest of the year. Let's look at our problems with self-denial. Let's look at it in a very small way. Let's look at it in terms of the parking lot. How many of you, when you drive into a big parking lot, go circling around trying to find that perfect spot up close by the door? You know what you are, don't you? You're a lot shark. Sir oh, yeah. Happy Shark Week. Lur. <laughs> Lurking on the surface of the asphalt ocean, going round and round and round, trying to find that perfect spot. And by the third time, you're getting frustrated and exasperated. And when that dear, sweet little old lady comes in and is a late arrival, she hasn't been circling for 15 minutes. She has no right to that place, and she tries to get into your place. Well, you hope it's not a Sunday, so you can demonstrate just how quickly you're able to drop the message. Or if you're the sweet little old lady and that young buck tries to take your space that you've been working 15 minutes for, you won't think you're a church lady. Oh, no. Something else entirely. How's your self-denial coming? We haven't even left the parking lot. I mean, I frustrate the people that I'm with because I'll go into a parking lot, I'll only go halfway up the line, I'll find a spot, I'll pull into it. They start to ask me, why are you stopping here? There have got to be better spots up front. I'm already out the door and heading for the front door. Because I'm going to save those 15 minutes of circling. I'm going to go in, get eaten before anybody else is even in there, just trying to avoid getting run over by those who are circling around in the parking lot. I mean, it's all business. As we walk to the door, they might ask me, hey, John, there are several other spaces up here. You've got to be more patient. You've got to go for those. They're the prime spots. 
I'm actually leaving them for someone else on purpose. Because I can walk. I can't. Thank God for that. Every week, every week, I count my blessings. I look at who manages to get themselves here and I just think, wow, can't I leave a stupid lot for somebody else? Back myself off just enough to give somebody else who actually needs it some room, not lose my religion in a parking lot, but claim it and show it even in a parking lot. How's your self-denial doing? And we haven't even left the parking lot. Should we go all the way, though? How about the parking lot here? Oh. Hold on now. As I used to say, gone to Medlin. Yeah. We have all this extra parking. I don't know if you've ever seen it, because to get to it, you actually have to go across the street back behind the homes that are over there to see the parking lot that we built and paid for to have more room. And we paid a lot of money for that parking lot. I mean a lot of money. It, oh, you were there at the time. Those who were around know that we paved that lot, fighting the neighbors and handling lawsuits. So let me tell you, we paid more for that parking lot than anybody else in El Paso has ever paid for a few measly parking spots. And the baseball field doesn't want to have to build any parking. Well, no, we won't go there. That's okay. That's inappropriate for a Sunday morning. <laughs> we paid for ours with sweat and tears. The problem is after all that work and all that time and all that money, nobody will park over there. Nobody will park over there. No, in between 10 and 11 o'clock when it's a little dicey, oh, people still prefer to sweep through the parking lot right out here, circling around for one of those prime spots. And when one of the poor little old ladies comes out at 10 o'clock and is trying to get to her car, you sit there and fume. Why can't she go faster? Because she's 92. And you don't even have a sticker anyway for the spot she's parked in. Move along. So still people get frustrated instead of going way over there and taking the, come on, it's not that big of a walk. You walk farther to go to lunch every day. They slide down that residential street and after getting and cultivating better relationships with the neighbors for a decade, you slide past that sign that says, please don't park. And you park because it's close. How's your self-denial coming? We still haven't even left the parking lot. And the reality is this. You can't be a disciple of Jesus Christ if you can't deny yourself. And the reason for that is this. To be a disciple, you have to back off and give Jesus the prime spot in your life. And if you can't back off over a parking spot or something trivial, how are you making any room for Jesus to have that spot? The spot He paid for. Way more than we will ever spend on a parking lot. The spot He earned with blood, sweat, and tears. But the spot He will never push you out of the way to get into. Because while His words are fierce and challenging, His heart is just so kind. So kind. And He will never demand that spot. And He will never shove His way into that spot. And He will never, never take it by force. Always waiting for us to invite Him in. But to be a disciple, we've got to deny ourselves to follow Christ. He has to have that spot. And the only way to do it is to let Him. To surrender ourselves enough to give Him that place. To back ourselves up enough to give Him that place. And then every day, when we push our way back into that prime spot, we have to say, wait a minute, Jesus. Here, it's yours again. So how's your self-denial coming? Because that means all the world to how Jesus fits into your life. Those who want to become my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross.
It's bigger than I thought it would be. <laughs> Isn't it always? Isn't it always bigger than you thought it would be? Heavier than you imagined? Anything that's got that kind of significance in our lives, isn't it always bigger than you thought? The cross always is. I mean, I've preached before about taking up your cross and pointed out that in part the cross is a road of suffering. And many of us imagine that the Christian invitation is to go into this place in life in which the suffering diminishes. But that's actually not the case. No, if anything, the heartache is deeper because we learn to have our hearts break for things the world has learned to ignore. We learn to weep with the love of God over the things that the world has grown calluses to deal with. We see the heartache of people and the world says, oh, it's a news item. And because it's bad news, it'll even draw the eye. So the way of the cross is, is not an easier way but it is a way of being healed and made whole by Christ even as our hearts break in new ways. But it's more than that. The cross is the place where heaven touches earth in the most powerful way imaginable. The cross is the place in which we understand the depths of God's forgiveness when Jesus looks at those who nailed Him there and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The cross is where we are invited to look at each other's hearts and even when the motivation is bad, to look deeper at why and how and the pain that's there. To go deep as Christ looks deep. The cross is the place where the love of God stands and we can no longer question the, the lengths God would go to redeem us and to draw near to us and the things He would allow us to do to bring us close. It's the place God draws all people to Him. This is the place, and I don't know what it is in your life, but it's the place of great weight because it's significant and it matters. And it's the place God can take your life and do something amazing and glorious and reach other people and show His love in an unquestioning way and offer forgiveness and wholeness. It's a place where, where if you would pick it up and carry it, nobody would question the fact that you know God and He's at least real for you. Because of what following Him leads you to do. And it ought to be heavy. If it's all that and more, it ought to weigh a lot. Those who want to be my disciples, Jesus said, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And if you're willing to begin to carry it, you find out. It's heavy, but it's not as hard as you thought. That there's something to be said for having something God can use on your back and in your heart. And that you're moving into the world with it.
I don't know what it is for you. For me, it's always been the church. The church because I know what the church is capable of when it's at its best. For me, it's been the church because I know the church can be a heavy place and sometimes it's got some heartache, but it's about much more than that. That the church is the place where we're at our best, the love of God is shown and forgiveness is offered. When we're at our best, the church is that place where heaven can touch earth. And I carry that burden for the church because I'm convinced that people are right when they say the days are gone when people believe and then they go and find some place to belong. That the people that are really outside the church and really desperate for the ministry of Jesus Christ have to belong first. And then if they see it lived out, maybe they'll come to believe. And so the church has got to be a place for people who don't yet believe can belong. And that means we have to do some different things. Those who want to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So he has to be out in front. I mean, you've got to let him be out there in front. You've got to fill your vision with the way of the cross and when you've lost that, refill your vision with the way of the cross again and, and what it means and what God is able to do in our lives. And when you lose sight of that, because we will, when you lose that glimpse of Jesus and you're not sure where He went and you're trying to follow, uh, but you've lost your way, no, it's not that hard. He only did a few things on His way to the cross. He gathered in the upper room with the disciples and they rehearsed the story of God's salvation and they ate together and they sang together and they worshipped together and then went out. And there are all sorts of ways in the life of the church to gather with other disciples and to learn and grow together. If you're trying to follow Jesus but you've lost sight, one place you can go is to a room full of disciples who are rehearsing the saving story of God and learning and growing together. He spent some time in the garden alone, just him and his father. And he was real in those moments, and he, he wept blood. And he showed his worry and his heart, asked for God to spare him, but whatever God's will was, that's what he was willing to do. And then he died. He died outside the walls, he died out beside a busy road. He died out there uh, where people didn't know they were invited into the sacred places and maybe that's why he had to be out there to die. You know, there was an ancient song that they used to sing and, and they would sing it at Passover time and it was Passover time when Jesus went to the cross. It was a song that the pilgrims would sing and, and they would ask each other, who can go up to the holy place? Who can walk into the temple of God? And the response is those with clean hands and a pure heart. What about the people whose hands are still dirty? That's actually who Jesus went to find. The ones who knew that song but never sang it because they knew they weren't invited. But Jesus knew they were. And the song ends up by saying, open up the doors, lift up the gates, that the king may ride back in. We have so many doors in the life of the church for you to use so that you can be a disciple. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow Him. So many ways to catch a glimpse of Jesus when you're trying to follow and you've lost sight of Him. But you've got to deny yourself. I know time is precious. Do you know what the word precious really means? I mean... Do you know what that word really means? What is worthy of your time? I've got things that are worthy. There are doors that lead us more deeply in our relationship with God. There are doors that lead us out to serve Him in the world and find those people outside the walls and outside the gates whose hands are still dirty. They don't think they can ever be clean, but that's where Jesus goes if 
you follow Him and if you're a disciple. So this morning, I want to invite you into some time to overcome those obstacles you have. That if you're having a problem with self-denial and you need God to help you get over that gap, if you need Him to help you put Him back in the driver's seat, let's spend some time and offer you some ways to do that. If you need to fill your vision again with the cross, I want to give you some time and some room to do that. If you've got in your heart a passion for the things God wants you to do and you know it's heavy and you're afraid to lift up that cross because you don't think you've got the strength, then it's time for you to ask God to give you some strength and then you just have to pick it up. But He'll help you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have some music. And then I invite you to a couple places this morning where you can go to find that grace and meet with God to follow Him. On the altar table, communion is set up. And if communion is one of those times for you in which you feel that grace of God and you get drawn closer to His heart and, and you remember what a disciple is and you feel that energy and that power to follow Him anew, then go to the altar table. Receive communion right off the altar table. We're not going to have ushers direct you. You're on your own this morning. You can use the ramp if you need the access or go right up. It's there for you. If you need to fill your vision again with the cross and put Jesus out in front of you, then I invite you to come down here to the front and kneel on these steps. We're not making it easy for you. We haven't pulled out the cushions to make it enjoyable. If you need help getting up, we'll help you. Neighbors help each other. We're the church. And over here to the side, I'll have some anointing oil. Because some of us need some healing so that we can follow. Some of us have ourselves at the center because we're defending ourselves. Because we hurt. And we haven't healed enough to let go of that spot so come and be anointed so you can surrender that spot to a loving God who will take care of you. Or maybe you need to be healed of doubt because you know there are things God wants you to do, but you just cannot believe you have the strength to do it. So come and allow the strength of God to heal your doubts and be with you. This time is yours and it belongs to God. Stay where you are and pray listen to the music or sing along. Come and fill your eyes with the cross. Go to the altar table and receive the gift of the bread of life. Come over here and be anointed for that healing and wholeness that God offers to you. Respond to the call of God as He leads you now. Walk through one of those doors open before you. Let the King of glory come anew into your life. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow Him today. Amen. As he leads you, will you come?